Stories of seafaring, shipwreck, mutiny and murder have long held a fascination, particularly for dwellers of this island nation. And in his latest investigative piece of narrative non-fiction, David Gran has a tale that grips from first page to last. The Wager was a vessel shipwrecked in the 1740s, its crew presumed lost until a group of survivors washed up on the coast of Brazil. Their story of survival would have been incredible enough, except for a second group of survivors to appear in Chile, with stories of mutiny, murder and even cannibalism. What follows is not so much a question of who is telling the truth, but of who gets to tell the story that will become the truth. A court-martial of individuals, but also the idea of empire itself. We sat down to talk about the pursuit of truth, human survival and the power of stories to endure. David, thank you so much for joining me uh, on the podcast. Um, you, it seems, could write about almost anything because uh, in the in the books that you've published so far, you've told some very, very different stories. And so I suppose my first question about The Wager is, why this story? Why did you spend, I presume, a fair amount of time researching and then writing this book? Yes, it, it took half a decade, uh, I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit. Um, you know, I um, I am a generalist, so I almost never write about the same subject. I kind of go from one uh, to the other. Um, I've always had an interest in mutinies um, because what is it about a military organization that is an instrument of order? What causes its people to suddenly disorder? You know, are they these extreme outlaws or is there something kind of rotten at the core of the system that may, in this case, justify the rebellion. I think that's why mutinies are kind of part of literature and film for so long. Um, and so I was looking into mutinies, and I came across uh, this account um, from John Byron, who had been the 16-year-old midshipman on His Majesty's ship, The Wager, when it set out. He, If the name is familiar, familiar, it's because he would later become the grandfather of the poet Lord Byron, whose poetry was influenced by what he referred to as my granddad's narrative. And I started reading this kind of old account. It was kind of written in archaic English. The S's were printed as F's. But I kept pausing over these spellbinding descriptions of what he called the perfect hurricane and mutiny and shipwreck and starvation and cannibalism, which he referred to as that last extremity. And I realized that this little account held the clues to one of the more extraordinary sagas of survival and resilience and mayhem um, that I'd ever come across. It was a real study of human nature. But to answer your question, that was what got its hooks into me. But what really compelled me to, to, to decide to do a book and to spend all these years on it was that I then was as fascinated, not only what happened after the wager became shipwrecked on a desolate island and descended into this real life Lord of Flies, but what happened when several of the castaways made it back to England mm. and there they were summoned to face a court martial for their alleged crimes on the island. And so many of them began to publish and release their testimony, um, hoping to save their lives. And I've always been interested in this line from Joan Didion where she said, uh, we all tell ourselves stories in order to live. But in their case, it was quite literal because if they didn't tell a convincing tale, they were going to get hanged. And so this provoked this great war over the truth with misinformation and disinformation. And of course, we are living through this same period now in which truth, especially in the United States, is completely under siege. And we talk about alternative facts and so-called fake news. And there's also a war over history. And in this case, there was a war over history. So I found in this strange kind of compelling, gripping saga, also a parable for our own turbulent times. And so it was all of that that, that sent me on my way. It, it, as you say, the, there's the, the thing that gets its hooks into you and then what you do in in this book, usually when I'm reading a book, I'll sort of be taking notes as I go along or underlining passages. And I realized as I was looking through my book preparing for today, I, I'd hardly made any marks because I was just literally <laughs> whipping through the book because I was so gripped by the story. And it is amazing that you managed to condense what is presumed, as you said, sort of, you know, five years of hard work into 250 pages which is incredibly short I suppose for a, a non-fiction title you might think but it's narrative it's so driven 
I, I, there's so much I want to cover, but what amazed me at the beginning, even, we know that this ship is going to be wrecked and it's going to be awful, but even at the enlistment stage for the wager, it seemed to me that it was sort of doomed to failure. I didn't realise how hard it was for them to literally get the crew together. Can you tell tell us a little bit about the extraordinary sort of motley crew that was assembled? Yeah, and and and, and like I said, I you know being a generalist, I'm not a naval historian. I'm certainly not a British naval historian. So <laughs> this was a crash course for me, uh, or a slow course, I should say. And and, and I because I come at this stuff new, I had the same response as you did, which hopefully I tried to convey in the account, which is, you know, oh my God, like I had no idea that, you know, when this expedition was setting out in a war, um, you know, they couldn't get people to, to man the ships because Great Britain um, did not have conscription and it had exhausted its supply of volunteers. So they sent out these press gangs to visit towns and ports and they would go out at sea and board ships they would head into pubs and they would basically eyeball you for any telltale signs of a mariner so if you had this round hat or a checkered shirt or they would even look at your fingernails you know if you had a little bit of tar under your fingernails it meant you worked on a ship because tar was used to make everything water resistant on a ship and they would suddenly seize you and drag you unwillingly onto one of these ships, you know, in effect, kidnapping you. And, you know, you'd be suddenly, you know, one minute you might be having a beer in a pub and the next minute you're going out on a perilous voyage where you are expected not to return for three years if you come back alive. Hmm. Um, and even then, even then, um, the Admiralty was short of men to, to man the squadron, which required about 2,000 uh, officers and crew to operate all the ships in the squadron. And um, and so they took this extreme step of of going to um, a pensioner's home, a retirement home, and rounding up these soldiers who were in their 60s and 70s. Um, <laughs> you know, you laugh because it's so gallows and it's just crazy. And they, some of them were missing an assortment of limbs <laughs> and some were so sick. You know, one, one had no leg and he hobbled off trying to desert. Um, others were lifted onto the ships on basically on stretchers um, because they were so sick. And, and everybody knew they were sailing to their death. So as you said, um, the seeds of destruction were planted at the very beginning of this expedition. And it, 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 it resonates with wars over centuries because it was typical of the public and the government kind of clamoring for war, but being unwilling to pay for it mm. and sending their use in many ways off to die. The uh, yeah, as you say, the 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 almost stealing of pensioners uh, and putting them on a ship was the bit where I, I just thought this this is going to go horribly wrong. We can tell yeah. this is going to go horribly wrong. W what you describe, I suppose, and that we know that um, for the ship to make its way to South America, it's going to be going around Cape Horn, and we all sort of feel like almost everybody knows that that's a, a very dangerous journey. But before they even get there, they have typhus first of all to deal with, and then scurvy. And your descriptions of how those two diseases affect the human body are so visceral. I don't think I've ever read anything that really made clear how awful they were. And it's sort of almost a miracle that there was anybody alive by the time they even get to Cape Horn. It sounded, it sounds awful. Yeah, it sounds awful. And it was, it was weird too, because I was writing about these diseases during COVID. And right. so I had this deep sympathy for the, I mean, you would have had sympathy anyways, but I, I guess a more almost visceral understanding because, you know, back then our medical knowledge was very limited and, and, and they didn't know what caused the spread of disease. They didn't understand germs, for example, and they certainly didn't understand that the cause of scurvy was just a deficiency of vitamin C. So they're speculating on all these. I remember I'd be writing about these things and there'd be like packages outside. I'd be leaving during COVID because like, can we touch these packages? Yeah. And then I was coming back to write and they're all like searching the ships, worrying about smells and odors. And, you know, they thinking, they thinking it has to be in the air somehow that is causing um, these diseases. But, you know, especially with, with scurvy, you know, it's one of these things that we all kind of vaguely recall and you hear about and you think, well, the gums get swollen. And I started to read these accounts and the diaries and the journals and, and um, the log books describing what was happening. And I, and I realized like I, I too, I didn't feel like I'd ever read a truly forensic accounting of what scurvy does to you. And 
So, you know, they're coming around Cape Horn and suddenly many of them could no longer get out of their hammocks. Um, their skin is kind of changing texture and color. Then for many of them, their, their, their teeth begin to fall out. Then their hair begins to fall out. Um, even the cartilage the, um, that seems to be gluing together their bones seems to be coming undone. There's, a, there's an account of one man who had fought in a battle five decades earlier. He had fractured a bone, which had obviously long since healed, and suddenly it just fractures again in the same in the same spot. And the other thing I didn't know about uh, scurvy was how much it can affect your senses. Hmm. How many in their accounts they describe having, you know, these these almost delusional dreams of of of, of kind of paradis paradisical island to get to, and then suddenly just sinking into total despair. And as one seaman said, the disease got into our brains and we went raving mad. And of course, the great tragedy was that the cure was so simple. You know, all they needed was some more fruit and vegetables in their diet. And before they came around Cape Horn, they had actually stopped in Brazil and there were all these limes. And had they just brought the limes on the ship, they would have been fine. And of course, as our listeners no doubt know, you know, <laughs> later when the British Navy learned that about vitamin C curing scurvy, they brought limes, which is why British seamen became known as limeys. But they didn't know that then. And so hundreds and hundreds of people perished um, uh, on this voyage during what is considered one of the worst outbreaks of scurvy ever recorded in maritime history. It is tr truly horrible to read, and it's not that it's a relief that they then encounter <laughs> the worst storm ever, but it, in this sort of litany of destruction, it is incredible. The, the rounding of Cape Horn and the, and the storm that they encounter see, makes it seem to me that it's impossible. Like, how, how does any ship manage to survive this this journey? But it's an incredible tale, and of course, they are shipwrecked. And the, the sort of desolation of where they are is wonderfully described and I understand that you made the journey to this very place more for you but in order I guess to understand what it's actually like can you describe what, what that part of the world is like and therefore what you what any of us would be seeing in front of us if we were to be shipwrecked there ourselves yeah so I, I spent about two years um or, you know the project took about five years and I spent the first two years just you know, kind of combing archives and reading archival records, which for anyone who knows me is the best place for me. I mean, I'm, I'm much more physically suited to be staring at documents than uh, being an adventurer. Uh, and, uh, but after about two years, I did start to wonder, you know, could I fully understand what it was like on this desolate island? So what happens is they, they come around Cape Horn and just for listeners, Again, you know that Cape Horn is bad, but I never kind of understood why. And when I did my research, I began to understand why. It's like the one place on Earth at the tip of South America where the seas travel uninterrupted around the globe. They're never impeded by land. So they accumulate force over about 13,000 miles, if my memory serves me. And you could have a 90-foot wave, as in the case with these storms that they encountered, dwarfing their mass, and you have the strongest currents and you have winds accelerating to hurricane force. And so as they're coming around the horn, they don't have enough men to work the shits because so many are dying of scurvy. They're breaking apart, and eventually the squadron of ships all scatter and separate, and the wager, the ship that I focus on in the expedition, is left to its own destiny. And it's coming up the um, coast of Chile, uh, where it eventually wrecks in a gulf called the El Golfo de Penas, which translates as the Gulf of Sorrows, or as some prefer to call it, the Gulf of Pain. I like to call it simply the Gulf of Pain. <laughs> Given that name, that should have deterred me from trying to make a trip there. Um, but I did wonder what would it be like when they got to this island. And so I tried um, to make a trip. And um, it remains a place of wild desolation with violent seas. You know, when I was on a little wood heated boat trying to get to this place, you know, I didn't see a soul for days and days. There are no settlements. You don't see other boats. I mean, to this day, it remains that remote. Um, and the seas were so rough that I would just have to sit on the deck in the cabin because if I stood, I would break a limb. I mean, you would just get chucked. Mm. And I just sat there 
um, seasick, uh, listening foolishly to Moby Dick on an audio recording. <laughs> um, I kid you not. That was not one of the wisest decisions. Um, uh, and then eventually getting uh, to this island, which again is windswept, uh, so windswept that the trees are all basically on 45 degree angles uh, because they're just per- permanently bent over from the gusts. Hmm. You know, they, they look to me like the trees look like they're lying on top of each other. It's actually <laughs> quite beautiful and arresting, but chilling. Um, it's cold. Uh, the temperature hovers around freezing. It was winter when I went. Um, and that was the same period when the castaways were there. Hmm. It was raining or sleeting. And like the castaways, we could find virtually no food. There are no animals uh, on the island. None. I mean, there's some birds that fly around. Um, there are some snails and mussels along the beach, but but uh, the castaways quickly exhausted their supply. And um, one British officer uh, described the island as a place where the soul of man dies in him. And I thought, well, <laughs> yeah. So. I got some sense of what that was like and how your soul <laughs> could die in you. <laughs> um, what's what's intriguing is that there is sort of two, uh, almost not salvation for them on this uh, d- deserted island they find themselves on, but they, they do, as you say, they do try to find food. And one of the things they eat is th- this sort of sea celery, which actually gives them the vitamins they need to get over the scurvy. So they suddenly start to feel a little bit better. And then they're also approached by the indigenous people who, who were sort of nomadic rather. The, is it the Kawaskar? Is that how that's pronounced? Yeah, the Kawaskar. I'm always bad with accents. It's on the second part, but I say Kawaskar. Kawaskar. And they, of course, are, you know, offer them some shellfish to help with their diet. But in the most perfect example, I think, of, of one of the problems of this sort of whole endeavor, their own, uh, the, the, the shipwrecked sailors, their sort of sense of superiority means that they end up driving away these people who could have helped them survive and indeed to, to, to get home again. Tell us a little bit about that exchange and why it's so painful to, to read yeah. about. Yeah, so the, the, the castaways are on this island. Um, their captain, a man named David Chief, uh, tries to set up a kind of imperial outpost on the island, governed by the same rules that govern the ship. But as they are starving, order is breaking down, and they are descending into these kind of warring factions. And then, almost suddenly, miraculously, out of the mist, emerges these canoes with the Karaskar. And the Karaskar had um, lived in this region um, you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years, and so they had adapted to this very harsh environment, so much so that when NASA here, that's our space exploration here in the United States, mm. um, was looking to put humans into, into space, they actually studied the Karaskar to see how did they adapt to this environment. And, you know, one of the things they did was they always kept fires in their canoes even going so that they could stay warm. And they knew all, they lived almost exclusively off marine resources. And they knew where to find him. And they spent most of their time in canoes, just traveling up and down, you know, this vast coastline uh, looking for food. And so they bring the, the castaways food and they offer them a lifeline. This is their best chance of survival, their best chance to ever get off of this desolate remote place. And yet um, several of the castaways blinded by their imperialist attitudes, these notions that somehow Western civilization was superior uh, to whom they would refer to in their journals as savages, um, mistreat the Karasquar. And the Karasquar are kind of looking, I mean, we don't have their written accounts. We only see this refracted, reflected through um, some of the castaways' accounts. But they're basically looking at these, you know, pale, hairy uh, castaways who are spiraling more and more into violence. And eventually they just say, you know what, we're out of here. And one morning they just disappear. And at that point, the castaways only descend further into a Hobbesian state of depravity. And a few of them even succumb to cannibalism. You mentioned there the, the captain, Cheap, and uh, earlier you mentioned Byron. So these are the two, two of the people from whom we can get an account of this uh, voyage. And the third person is, is Bulkley who is a gunner on the ship and does a rather 
extraordinary thing, which is to, to write his own logbook and account. And it's important that, isn't it? Which a gunner would not usually be writing their account of a voyage. Uh, it seems to me that that's such a crucial part of telling this story. Can you tell us a bit about Bulkley and, and why that journal was so important in the writing of your own book? Yeah, so um, this is, a, 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 as I, we talked about a little bit earlier, a war over the truth. Mm. And and um, and so we get to see, and I try to tell the, the, the whole narrative through the warring perspectives of three people, David Sheep, the captain, John Byron, the 16-year-old midshipman, and John Bulkley, the gunner. And Bulkley's a really interesting historical figure. He... Um, was very religious. He, um, we don't know what he looked like, what he looks like, because unlike, for example, David Cheap or John Byron, he didn't come from the upper classes, so he could never have afforded to have a portrait made of him. Um, yet we know what he thought, mm. um, probably as as well, if not better than anyone, because he was this compulsive diarist. He was very literate, even though he came from the lower to middle classes, and. He was on the wager, um, probably the most skilled seaman of anybody, and he was this instinctive leader. Yet, because um, he did not come from the aristocracy during that period of class structure, he knew that he was never going to become a captain or a commander of a warship. Yet, suddenly on this island, in this democracy of suffering, could he suddenly emerge as instinctive leader as a commander in his own right? And he is smart enough to know that if, while there are these warring factions on the island, if they ever get back to England and they have to tell their story, um, their fates will depend on these stories. And so even while he is on the island, he is keeping this contemporaneous journal, this piece of evidence and shaping his story uh, to make sure that he will survive. And so each of them are trying to emerge as the hero of their own story to live what they have done or haven't done. And in many ways, that's not so untrue of the way we all tell ourselves stories, but for them, the stakes were obviously much higher. Mm. Um, talking of, of high stakes uh, and people who get to tell their story, I was really intrigued by one other character. Well, I was intrigued by plenty of other characters, mm -hmm. but one that I want to mention now was John Duck, who, who, was, a, who was a freeman, a freed black slave who was on the ship. And as the sailors are trying to work out how to get home and what the best route would be to sort of um survive one of those options is to is to find the spanish basically and of course for john duck that runs the risk of him being captured and put back into slavery which of course is terrifying and that is what happens to him eventually isn't it he is captured and goes back to and we he disappears from the record and it's so important, isn't it, that idea of, as you say, who gets to tell the story of what has happened? And that, of course, that privilege not given to a man like John Duck, who seems from the accounts to have been this thoroughly decent, thoughtful and wonderful man. Yeah, he was very, he was evidently very well liked. And the thing about ships is they were in some ways more, they, you know, they, the same racism was often pervasive on them. And yet, because people live so closely together, and people were forced to perform many of the same tasks, um, there could be more tolerance sometimes, sometimes black, free black seamen would find um, on a British ship, um, uh, you know, the less stratification than they did back on land. Mm. And, and John Duck was clearly just from the other accounts, a very competent and capable seaman and uh, which earned him a amount of respect. And he, like some of the other survivors, you know, he manages to survive coming around Cape Horn. He survives the scurvy outbreak. He survives the shipwreck on an island. He then survives the starvation and the spiraling violence of seamen upon seamen. Then he survives one of these crazy castaway voyages. But unlike some of the other survivors who make it back to England, he can't tell his story. He is, in fact, as you say, he is kidnapped and sold into slavery. And I could find no record of what happened to him. And I think it is very important. I was very haunted by that silence. And I think as a historian researching these stories, it's very important to highlight that because 
empires preserve their power not only by the stories that they tell, but also by the stories that they don't tell, by those mm. pages that are ripped out. And, and John Ducks is one of those pages, one of those stories that is ripped out of the history books. As you say, that the, the, the story, I suppose, what happens when those two competing camps, if you like, of sailors do, do make it back to England, there is this threat of court-martial and, and for the Admiralty to, to sort out what has happened. And in many ways, as you say in the book, that this is really not just a trial of the men, but it, the, the spectre of it being a trial of the whole idea of empire and what that mission and voyage was all about. And I suppose that's part of the reason why the Admiralty get a bit spooked uh, about pushing things too far. Um, it, it's it's really fascinating to see this as a, as a microcosm, if you like, of the imperial idea. Is that how it felt to you as you were sort of doing your researches and, and that that's why you presented it that way in the book yes i mean you you, you i always you know the theme i i'm somebody who finds stories from the particulars and then figures out try to figure out what their dimensions are and their themes so for me coming across john byron's story that got its hooks in me but then you start to figure out its dimensions and what is it representing? You start to figure out its themes. And of course, as you dig deeper into the story and you read about the denouement, it can't help um, but become a microcosm or emblematic uh, of this notion of what is empire, um, the consequences of empire. And this is really a story about the meditation on the way we tell stories, but also as nations and empires tell stories or mythologize stories. And so this is a classic case of that because they get to this court martial, and just as they had waged a war on the island, uh, the seamen, now they begin to wage a war over the truth. And there is, you know, disinformation. There are, I swear, there are allegations of fake journals. Um, journals are being rewritten to kind of mislead, and there's plagiarism. There's all these kind of currents of disinformation, these things we say today, as the seamen are trying to save their lives. But at the same time, and more profoundly, the empire, the powers that be, the authorities um, seem to be listening to these stories thinking, you know, do we like any of these stories? <laughs> um, because, you know, our officers and crews are supposed to be um, the vanguard of the empire, these apostles of civilization. And yet, you know, if you listen to these accounts, they look more like brutes than like gentlemen. So they begin to try to manufacture their own alternative history or seize upon their own elements of the story. And so just as individuals and people tell stories to serve their self-interest, uh, so do nations. And this is such a perfect illustration of that. And it was a story that subject that really had interested me after my last book, Killers of the Flower Moon, which was about the systematic killings of members of the Osage Nation in Oklahoma here in the United States for their oil money in the early parts of the 20th century. And I was always struck by that story because, you know, outside the Osage Nation, most Americans had never heard of this story. We had not taught it. I include myself. We had excised it from our consciousness. So I was so interested in why certain stories become part of our collective consciousness, what narratives we choose to tell and mythologize. And the story of the wager is an almost perfect illustration. You can almost see the mechanics of how that actually happened. First, as people are shaping the story, but then ultimately as the empire tries to shape its story. That's so interesting. And of course, in your role as, as sort of, I suppose, bringing that story to light, uh, you have to be very careful, presumably, in not uh, preferring any of those three versions of the story. You have to sort of maintain that distance. But I'm sure that through your contact with these men, there must be a part of you that becomes more attached to, to one over the other. Or have you managed to maintain professional distance at all times? Yeah. So I, I do say, you know, at the very beginning of the book that I've kind of sifted through all these accounts and present them. And, and there are parts that can never be always completely reconciled. And I, I, I kind of leave it to the reader. I trust the reader to interpret. I, I think the reader needs to be fully engaged mm. in the process of, of the most critical part, which is history's judgment and coming to that. And so I, as I tell the account from each perspective, 
you don't so much sympathize with each person, but you really are trying to understand them. And what is interesting about this story um, is that people are not reductive and there are neither kind of pure heroes for the most part or pure villains. In fact, you can read in the same person at one moment might do something of, of great sacrifice and heroism and gallantry and then moments later, you know, commit an act of shocking uh, brutality. I mean, it is a real case study of human nature being peeled back step by step on that island. Um, and so you're trying to understand that. So when you are writing, because I was writing from shifting perspectives, I would be so immersed in their perspective. You know, you're kind of just with them and you can understand them. Um, but then, of course, you know, you'll you'll then shift out of their account. So, you know, one of them might say suddenly, you know, I was forced to proceed to extremities on the island. And you're like, oh, OK. And then you pick up the next count. And he said, oh, yeah, he shot the man right in the head and he bled out of my arms. And you're like, oh, OK. So um, and that's like a shocking awakening uh, to, to the blinding of one's perspective. Um, I will say that um, I found, I mean, Bulkley is if you want to live, you should attach yourself to Bulkley. Um, he was uh, a very kind of ingenious um, uh, um, force of survival and resilience um, and shows some real capacity of leadership. But he would also be cold at times and make these at times very ruthless decisions or uh, in order to survive. And he would basically ask himself, is it a sin to want to live? Mm. Um, but I suppose to answer your question now that I've dodged it for so long <laughs> is that um, the, the person who I think the readers will most be able to relate to is John Byron because he was just so young uh, uh, um, on the expedition. And he is in many ways our eyes and ears onto this very bewildering world. First on the ship as he's training to become an officer and he has to learn all about this new, new floating civilization. And then as he has to witness that floating civilization disintegrate on the island and watch as people turn on each other. So he's essentially coming of age, um, not only amid the brutal natural elements, um, but also amid the elements of human nature, you know, is the, the kind of probably the most, uh, the, the, perhaps the most startling revelation to me in working on this book is there is nothing is more uh, desperate and unpredictable uh, than human beings, especially desperate human beings. Absolutely. Uh, there's this, I suppose, this frisson as well for the reader, which is that knowing that he will go on to become the grandfather of a very famous Byron, and knowing how close he must have come to dying on this voyage. So you just think that with a stroke, you know, that we had, could have had a completely different history, a completely different culture. Yes. Um, and that's a sort of very weird energy to have when you're reading a book. Um, with those three competing narratives, of course, there would be a challenge for anybody who adapted this book into a film to decide which narrative to sort of focus on. Your books do have this amazing ability to be turned into film. And I know that you've just come back from Cannes where Killers of the Flower Moon has had its premiere and by all accounts, ecstatic response and, and reviews from people who've, who've seen it. What do you think it is about your books that seems to lend them so well to film adaptation? Or do you not worry yourself about that? You just get on with the writing. You know, I, it, it's always slightly bewildering to me. It's something I never expected. It's happened to me very late in life. I mean, it wasn't like I, I've been writing for a long time that anyone was adapting my work for many years. <laughs> and then suddenly people are like, oh, these would make good movies. And suddenly, you know, you know, I've had this, um, been kind of blessed by having uh, my books in some way, uh, stories turned into films. Um, and it still somewhat bewilders me. I, you know, I, and I can't, I don't know if I can really answer it. I, I think what, because they're very different mediums. I mean, mm. you know, I'm dealing with, I don't think anyone looking at John Byron's, you know, 18th century journal written archaic English would have been like, ooh, this is going to be a good movie. <laughs> um, so, you know, it doesn't actually occur to me when I'm working on them. Um, and then, you know, later the book comes out and people express interest. I'm like, oh, huh. Um, I suppose, um, I do think though, you know, the thing that draws me to these stories is their richness, is their complexity, is that they are studies of human nature. And then hopefully, if I've done my job, they raise these very larger themes, um, you know, about civilization or about society, about human nature, about racism, imperialism, whatever it might, whatever it might be, um, the injustice and killers of the flower moon, 
the whitewashing of history and Killers of the Flower Moon, um, the treatment of Native Americans. So they, I think they, I, if if my my best guess, because it really is just a guess, is I think that these stories themselves are what have the power, and they do lend themselves to be told in different ways. And for me, the great thing that comes out of these films is that I do really believe in these stories. I mean, I, you wouldn't spend, you know, the Killers of the Flower Moon took half a decade and the wager took half a decade. And so the idea that these stories will then kind of go on and grow and be told in different ways. And um, to me, that's the richness. That's, that's, that's the great, but I don't know if I can fully answer your question, but I think if I gave my best answer, it would be something about the stories themselves um, that draw you to them and that, you know, hopefully I tell them in such a way. I certainly try to um, write in a way that that sparks our senses so that you can visualize and see and smell and hear, which is why the journals and diaries are so important and why the research takes so long. And so then I try to distill them to their essence. But the reason it takes so long is I'm trying to comb every detail and yet be precise and accurate to what the accounts say. I think, uh, yes, you do the hard work so that Hollywood doesn't have to. We can see <laughs> behind you the sort of piles and piles of papers. Um, so if it has sort of the veracity of, of histor- you know, historical writing, but it has this sort of thrill of, of a, a film when you're reading it. I, I got to the end of this book sort of amazed that I was alive at the end of it because it <laughs> seems such a trial, as you say, of human survival. It's just extraordinary. Um, and yeah, I, I just I can't thank you enough for it. It was it was a thrill to read, and and I'm I'm glad that I can't believe you went there after knowing what you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad you made it back. <laughs> thank you. Yes, yes. I my 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 little expedition which I was probably not my brightest idea, but it really was essential to the writing of the book. It really did. And what's interesting in the book is I don't actually describe my own expedition, um, but it informs so many of my descriptions. Well, you can tell it's de- it's definitely in there, David. Thank you so much for for giving me some time to to talk to you about it. It really is a fantastic book and uh, a testament, as I say, to the, the other books of yours that contain the, the same ingredients, as you say, important stories that are filled with truth, but told in a way that just engages the reader on every page. So thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>